Good evening, everyone. I think I came out a little bit too early, maybe, and just <laughs> before our musicians were finished, but they'll have a little more time. Welcome tonight. This is a concert that I have been so much looking forward to, and I think of all the concerts this year, it's the one that, that uh, I find the most fascinating, and I hope you will, too. We're celebrating a lot of things with this concert. We're celebrating the fact that this is, across our nation, Polish Heritage Month, and that's a very big deal in our city. Uh, we're celebrating the 200th birthday of one of the greatest composers of all time, Frederick Chopin. And we're celebrating a wonderful collaboration that's fairly new for the Buffalo Philharmonic with not only the Polish Cultural Institute of New York City, but also with the Kosciuszko Foundation. And I want to say a special thank you to Christopher Golinski, who's the president and who worked very hard with us to make this collaborative concert possible. So we have on the program three great Polish composers. Some might be a new discovery, two might be a new discovery for you, Chopin certainly you know. And I invited someone who I think many of you will know at least by voice, if not by um, his appearance, um, because he is one of the most wonderful radio hosts of WNED, uh, Michael Zachowicz, um, is a friend of mine, has been a friend of mine since I met him when I first came to Buffalo. As, as I mentioned, you'll hear him in the evenings on WNED. He is uh, the organist at the Queen of Martyrs Church and elsewhere in the Buffalo Diocese. He's a very active member of the Polish American organization, not only in Western New York, but nationally. He is the grandson of Polish immigrants and he is very passionate about raising awareness of, among fellow Americans about the incredible heritage that we have from musical heritage from Poland. So let's welcome our very special guest, Michael Zachowicz. Welcome. <laughs> welcome, Michael. Michael surprised me tonight with his appearance, so I'm going to let him explain a little bit about who he is exactly. Well, dobry wieczór państwo. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm, I'm here to... It's so great to be here, Joel. We have a wonderful concert. Thank you that you organized this. We have not only the, the concerto in F minor by Chopin with the lovely Berenika Zakszewska performing, we have a couple of 20th century works by Szymanowski and Lutosławski. And um, let's see, we have, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes. Let's, uh, yes. I, I look forward to making this succinct, but informative and hopefully entertaining. Uh, I'm well, I should say, no, yes. we're, we're sitting, we have here sitting on the stage one of the greatest experts alive of Polish music. So you go for I, it. I, I'm flattered by that, <laughs> right. Well, uh, you might ask, well, what am I wearing over here? Yes. Well, this might be the outfit found not only throughout Enlightenment Europe, but uh, maybe particularly in Warsaw, Poland, and Warszawa, say around May 3rd, 1791. Now, what's the significance of that date? On that date, uh, tens of thousands of people gathered in Warsaw, and the, the last king of Poland, King Stanisław August Poniatowski, was carried around on the shoulders because a, a constitution was just proclaimed in Poland. It was the first in Europe, the second in the United, uh, the second in the world next to the United States. Uh, it came a few months before that of France, but all three stemmed from similar political philosophies, uh, perhaps uh, embodied by the words of Wawrzyniec Goszlicki, who is he, a, a Polish political philosopher who, uh, back in the late 16th century, uh, wrote his treatise De Optimo Senatore and called for representative government. It turned absolutist Europe on its ears. One of its most stirring lines in Latin, of course, was we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Of course, Thomas Jefferson uh, used sources from various places when, when forming the, uh, the I early... Know. I didn't you know, know there that. We know. A lot of things to learn, isn't it amazing? I think yeah. so, yeah. All right, so the, the Constitution of May 3rd uh, has served over the last couple of centuries as... as uh, something the Polish people are so proud of over the, uh, during their struggles for independence. And uh, among the crowd uh, that, that watched this happening was a about 19, 20-year-old Frenchman, uh, son of a wheelwright who came from Lorraine by the name of Nicolas Chopin. So what is Nicolas Chopin doing? And he would be the father of the future composer whose 200th birthday we're celebrating today. Okay, let's go back in time a little bit, maybe a century or so. Uh, in the, uh, well, King John Sobieski, a name perhaps we're familiar with, led allied forces uh, and, and, and uh, lifted the siege of Vienna back in 1683. Uh, 
And Poland was looked upon in such, uh, the, the siege was from the Ottoman Turks. Uh, Vienna was sort of the capital of Christendom at the time, and uh, King John Sobieski was looked upon as a, uh, a hero for Europe. And Poland uh, at that time was a very large country, and uh, it was multi-ethnic, uh, uh, religious tolerant. It had an elected monarchy since the uh, late 16th century. And I'm telling you all these details, but this is, this is the kind of Poland that Chopin was aware of, and this is what uh, inspired him and his music. And, you know, it's impossible to take out... This wig is getting very hot, by the way, but it's all right. <laughs> so, uh, it's impossible to talk about composers and their works outside of the historical context with, within which they live. So, so uh, forgive me for elaborating a little bit on the background of Polish history, but it's, it's so important to understand this, that every Pole... Uh, was aware of, of these historical contributions and uh, all right so what happens in the early 18th century because of things politically King Stanisław Leszczyński was forced to advocate uh, abdicate he was a very enlightened monarch and he found refuge in the Duchy of Lorraine where his son-in-law King Louis the 15th of France uh, gave him uh, uh, what do you call it uh, exile uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Asylum. Um, asylum. Asylum. I think that's what I'm looking for. So again, that stems back to uh, French-Polish relations over the year. All right. In this Duchy of Lorraine, not only did the Polish king bring his entourage, but a large community of Poles, and there was a Polish enclave in Lorraine. In this area was a uh, French wheelwright by the name of Francis, Francois Chopin, the grandfather of the future composer, and one of his children was Nicholas, whom I made reference to. And Nicholas, while uh, this is already the 1780s, while a uh, revolution is brewing in France, decided to seek his fame and fortune in Poland. So he traveled there with a family friend who owned a snuff factory. And so this young Nicholas Chopin leaves his homeland. Revolution breaks out in France. He loses all contact with his family. He uh, adopts Polish, and he learns the Polish language. He actually fights in the uh, national uprising uh, in 1794 with Kosciuszko. Uh, Kosciuszko is a name all Americans should be aware of. Uh, Colonel and later General Tadeusz Kosciuszko was an engineer. He helped build the fortifications at Saratoga and uh, at West Point and was very instrumental in the fledgling United Colonies uh, gaining their independence. He, along with Kazimierz Pułaski, another uh, uh, Polish general, uh, he's the father of the American cavalry. You know, so I mention these people just because to show the ties that Poland and the United States had. Uh, there are some similars, similarities between Poland and the United States at the time. Uh, again, an elected monarchy, uh, you had religious toleration, uh, over 70% of the world's Jewish people lived in Poland, stem, uh, dating back to policies of King Casimir the Great back in the 14th century. Uh, you had, uh, it was a multi-ethnic uh, commonwealth, but unlike the United States separated by a vast ocean from Great Britain, Poland was surrounded by the Russian Empire, the Austrian Empire, the Kingdom of Prussia, who looked upon their democratic strives as a threat to their autocracy, and in a series of partitions, wiped off Poland off the map of Europe. If you look at a map of Europe around 1750, you'll see the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the Rzeczpospolita, as we called it. And if, if you look uh, at a map of, of uh, Europe in 1800, Poland does not exist. So, Nicholas Chopin uh, adopted his new country, he uh, served in the Polish National Guard in the Kosciuszko Uprising. That failed. Poland was partitioned for the final time. The king forced to abdicate. So Nicholas Chopin decides to make his living in Poland teaching French. Uh, eventually, one of his students would be Maria Walewska, who turned out to be Napoleon's Polish mistress and bore him a son, and that's another story. All these little tidbits are fascinating. Uh, so uh, where are we? Okay, turn of the century here. Uh, oh. Polish troops fought then with Napoleon. They put their hopes in Napoleon to help uh, reestablish an independent Poland. A duchy of Warsaw was set up. The Polish troops were among the first to march with the Grand Armée into Russia and among the last to leave. The Polish troops fought all over the continent and elsewhere. Uh, another little tidbit, I have a tendency to deviate, but I always return to the point of departure. Uh, the, in 1804, the French colony of Haiti uh, staged a rebellion of their own against French rule and French soldiers were sent in to, rep to repress this rebellion, among them Polish soldiers. When they found out that the Haitians are also fighting for their independence, he said, wait a minute, that's what we're fighting for. They, they jumped sides, they helped the Haitians win their independence. Anybody from Haiti that knows their history knows of the Polish contribution to Haitian independence. Anyway, just a side note, they use this phrase for za naszym i waszym wolność, for your freedom and ours. And over the centuries, you would have Polish troops fighting for freedom all around the world. All right, let's get back to musical things here. So, 
So Nicholas Chopin settles down, marries a woman, uh, Justyna Krzyżanowska. You know, I like to say, when people say, well, was Chopin French, was he Polish? You know, he was, happened to be born in Poland, but, you know, most of his creative output oh, was... Don't, in, don't the French try and claim him as their own? Yes, they do. But uh, I like to put it, uh, put it this way. Chopin's mother was Polish by birth, and his father was Polish by choice. So, you know... And that's, had, that's what I hear, too, that he completely adopted his new country in every yes, way. Yes, in every way. So, uh, the, the family of uh, the Chopins uh, were brought up outside of Warsaw, and uh, little Freddy, Frederic Franciszek Chopin, uh, Fritzek as he was called, showed an enormous amount of talent at an early age, and uh, he wrote his first Polonaise at age seven. Now, what is a Polonaise, we might ask? Well, there are five national dances in Poland. Uh, there's the Oberek, the Kujawiak, the Krakowiak, which comes from the region of Kraków in southern Poland, and what's characteristic of that is it's in two-fourths time with a syncopated rhythm, kind of one, two, four, one, two, four. Uh, in, in fact, in Chopin's E minor concerto, he incorporates that in the final movement. And also there's uh, his opus 14, Rondo alla Krakowiak. Uh, and the other two dances are the Mazur, which we know maybe by its diminutive Mazurek or Mazurka, which we'll get to, and the Polonaise. Now, the Polonaise is the stately dance that has its origins in the 15th century. And it's very March-like and, and deliberate, and it's in three-fourths time, but unlike a waltz, one, two, three, one, two, three, it's four and two, or more specifically, one, two, and three, four, one, two, bum, ba -da -dum, bum, bum, bum. And you'll, you'll see a lot of uh, composers working with the alla polacca uh, tempo. Not only Bach, uh, another point of departure, Bach happened to work for the elector of Saxony, who was elected king of Poland, so by default, Bach actually was the court composer to the king of Poland for a short period of time, even though he never left his native Eisenach. And, and you'll see in uh, Bach's notebook for Anna Magdalena Bach, uh, there's a number of Polonaises there. Also in his uh, uh, orchestral suite number two, there's a Polonaise. Uh, Georg Philipp Telemann wrote a number of Polonaises. Uh, let's see. And later on, even Franz Josef Haydn, just last week at the radio station, to my surprise, I'm playing a Haydn trio, and one of the second movements was this lovely little Polonaise in there. And later on, Beethoven wrote a, a piano a piece, his opus 89 is a Polonaise, and his triple concerto uses an alla polacco rhythm. Uh, Schubert, and of course the Russian composers later on, we're jumping ahead of things now, but the famous Polonaise from Yevgeny Onegin by Tchaikovsky. So there's this Polish rhythm, bum, ba -da -dum, bum, bum, bum. And that was Chopin's first composition in G minor at the age of seven. He would write many more throughout his life. And uh, I was also talking about the, mazur the mazurek, or mazurka, as we call it. And he wrote, Chopin wrote a number of those throughout his life, 58 to over 60, depends which... So, so when he was writing Polonaises and mazurkas, he's actually paying a tribute to his country then? Most definitely, most definitely. And to the heritage of the Polish people. take uh, the Polish dances that he knew best and took them to an international level. Uh, you know, he would... He's such a blend of the patriotic Pole with you know, his music is so international and transcends boundaries, um, the, the perfect balance of the two. In his childhood, he studied, back to, back to little Frederick Chopin, studied with the uh, Czech violinist Wojciech Zivny, uh, who instilled within Chopin a great appreciation for Bach and Mozart. And, uh, but it became evident that he had outgrown his teacher, studied then with Josef Elsner at the Warsaw Conservatory. For the most part, Chopin was self-taught. He took lessons from his mother. It wasn't really until age 13 that he actually enrolled formally, but by this time he had developed his own yeah. playing technique. And you know. I, I think this is wonderful about Chopin. We say that Chopin really, he's a complete original. He had no one before him prepared him for who he was. His music came from himself. It, it came from the piano, I read. I don't know if you agree with, with this, Michael, that it came from the piano. Chopin, in playing the piano at such an incredible level, he was a great virtuoso, actually learned about music from the instrument itself. So that's why his, his writing is so completely unique in every way. And also, I, I don't know if you agree with this, the fact that Poland was so often conquered and wiped out and traded around and divided up, that there was so much influence, a great wealth of influence, that there wasn't a German style that he followed. He followed his own way. And it's, it's extraordinarily original music. No, you agree? Definitely. And also, you mentioned about... Uh, the piano at the time, he was one of the first to really utilize the new kind of piano. 
I'm not that much of an expert on it, but say for instance the forte piano previously, it didn't have the kind of dynamics that, uh, that it later had when Chopin started to uh, use a lot of the chromaticism and just the whole dynamics of the piano. Um, maybe if we had a piano expert yeah. to talk more about this, they could elaborate. But definitely, Chopin is all about the piano. You know, when, when we think about other composers of the time, they're very much about the orchestra. And even when they're writing for concerto, writing concertos, it's the piano and the orchestra, even Beethoven. The, the two mighty forces, Chopin was not really very interested in the orchestra. He stopped writing for orchestra when he was 21, so he didn't spend a long time on the orchestra. He wrote six pieces that involved the orchestra between maybe 19 and 21. And then he decided to concentrate on the instrument that he loved. And he wrote only for piano after that but with such nuance and such shading that it, no one has ever equaled his, his sensitivity to the possibilities of the color of the piano. And as you say, he wrote those works for piano and orchestra when he was around 19 or 20, didn't really feel a need for it afterwards. Primarily he wrote those because he needed to be a concertizing pianist, exactly. so he wrote his own works. Uh, the, one of the first was the Opus 2 variations on Mozart's La Cidarem La Mano from uh, Mozart's Don Giovanni, to which the music critic at the time, Robert Schumann, gave his famous hats off gentleman, a, a genius. Uh, he also wrote the Opus 13 uh, fantasy on, on Polish airs, utilizing his mother's favorite Polish folk song. Maybe some of you know it, Yushmieszon Zeszed or uh, Laura Ifilon. La, 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 la. I'll spare you from more humming, but uh, so when you hear these things, when you hear these works, or the Rondo Alakrakowiak I made reference to, and you think, well, this is one of our own. Our, our, our son is taking our music to the international stage. It's, uh, and he did uh, it. He did it. Tell us a little bit, just because then we've got to go on to our, our more modern composers. This second movement of the F minor concerto, this love letter. Tell exactly, us a little that's what I was going to say. It's sort of a love letter to one of his early loves, uh, Constancia Gładkowska. And unfortunately, that didn't work out. He had. It's fascinating to talk about the, the women in Chopin's lives and uh, the impact they had on him. Uh, but it is, it, he utilizes uh, sort of a nocturne like. Uh, the quality that's only characteristic of Chopin during that second movement. You know, the, the uh, first movement starts out at the, the intro of the orchestra, and then Ed Yadzinski does a great job in writing about that, and as he always does. I, I love reading the, the notes beforehand. He does a great job. And in the, uh, he mentions how finally the pianist enters, almost like a, a cavalier. Uh, and we'll, we'll hear Berenica, I'm sure, do a wonderful job, which is another reason I love Chopin. We hear different interpretations all the time. It's true. And, uh, it's true. And, you know, sometimes people, b conductors bemoan the fact that Chopin didn't spend a lot of time with great detail for the orchestra. Um, but I always say that the moment, the very moment the piano enters, it doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter what the orchestra plays anymore. See if you agree. It, the piano writing is like some magical thing from heaven, and it really doesn't matter what we do. I mean, we try and stay out of the way of that incredible, incredible genius that he has. But this second movement always touches me. I think you'll feel the same way, because um, he was in love with this fellow student at the conservatory, um, and she never knew about it. And he was too shy, I guess he was very, very shy, too shy to tell her. Many, many, many years afterwards, she read a biography of his after, long after he died, and she realized, Chopin was in love with me. But then she said, I don't know if this is crushing, she said, well, she had married a, a Warsaw business person. She said, he wouldn't have been a good husband, though, too temperamental and too much full of fanciful ideas. <laughs> but he did have a great love of his life, as some of you know. If you've ever heard of the novelist Georges Sand, uh, uh, her real name was Aurélie uh, Aurora Dudevant, yes, the, the cigar-smoking, pant-wearing femme right. fatale. She was a real feminist at a time that no one even knew that name, word. But uh, she was a great novelist and used the pen name Georges Saint. And they were constant, turbulent companions, but uh, they had a, a, a great romance. So, But we got to go on to Ludoslavsky and... So we we do. Uh, let's see, how could we talk about Polish history at the time just to lead into this? Because it's a common thread, the strive for independence, and it can't be taken out of the, the, the context of, of the composer. So 1830, there's another uprising against the Russians, and, and Chopin never returns to his homeland. He has with him a goblet of Polish earth, eventually it would be scattered on his grave, and he has these productive years, though, in France. He wants to go back and fight. His friends say, no, uh, what good will being a soldier do? You're weak and, and feeble. Uh, 
promote Poland through your art, as, as writers did, as artists did throughout the 19th century. There was this Polish messianism that uh, uh, proclaimed you know, Poland would be the, the suffering Christ among nations, suffering for the sins of Europe, and like the phoenix rise up again. And the writer Norwid spoke of a Slavic pope in the future that would liberate his people. Can we say John Paul II in years to come? But uh, we have a series of uprisings. Every generation of Poles uh, fought for that independence. And other composers throughout the century have uh, Stanislav Moniuszko with his operas. We have Vinyavsky, the great violinist. Uh, Karwowicz, hopefully we'll hear some music of him. Unfortunately, died at age 32 in an avalanche. But so we'll, we lead now into, uh, well, 1882 is when uh, Karol Szymanowski was born. And uh, he studied violin and piano. He was part of a, of a new Polish movement. You know, there were different different uh, factions at work in Poland. Some called for armed insurrection. Some said, hey, man, let's, let's take a more positive approach. Let's work with the arts. Um, oh, don't forget Paderewski as well. Uh, yes, who's, uh, his father was, was uh, taken prisoner by uh, some Russian authorities as well shortly after that uprising. So, you know, all these composers experienced what was going on in Poland at the time. Eventually, uh, Paderewski would be very instrumental, no pun intended, in, in uh, seeing a new Poland created after World War I. So Szymanowski, uh, what can we say about him? All right, there were different phases in his life. You know, again, in 1905, he wrote what we're going to hear, his concert overture. And as many have said, it's kind of Strauss-like, very, uh, although there's some unique qualities about it. It's, it. That's Szymanowski, but you can see the influence of Richard Strauss. Absolutely, yeah. very romantic. Yes, and then yes. he was the teacher for our other... Rutoswavsky as Rutoswavsky. well, among others. Yes, uh, so Szymanowski, well, there were a few periods. Uh, he also traveled around the Mediterranean and, and incorporated a lot of different uh, Middle Eastern uh, and even some Oriental elements into his music. Uh, Okay, we're getting to, uh, well, we're, let's see here, where should we go? Vito Lutoswowski, 1913, he's born. Well, what's going on in, the, in Poland at the time? I'll, I'll spend just uh, a minute on this, or, or a little more, perhaps. Uh, World War I begins, and you have the three partitioning powers, the Russian Empire, the, Aust the Austrian Empire, and the, what was the Kingdom of Prussia, now the German Empire, fighting each other. You have uh, Germany and Austria defeated. You have the Russian Revolution taking place. There's this vacuum in Central Europe. Now, another thing, uh, majority of the war on the Eastern Front took place on Polish soil. You had fratricide going on. Poles conscripted in the Russian army, f fighting Poles uh, drafted into the German and Austrian army. Total devastation on the Polish land. The, the scorch and burn policy on the part of the, uh, the uh, warring factions. Uh, you had three different economies, even railroad gauges, so it was quite, it's one thing to have our independence granted. Okay, Poland is a free country, but a lot of rebuilding had to be done. Also fighting then the, the Soviets, who wanted to have world revolution in Europe, but the Poles had something to say about that and handed the Soviet Union their only defeat. That's another story. All right, Poland enjoys independence briefly through uh, the 20s and up until 1939. Uh, during this time, Lutosławski, who was born in 1913, uh, he studies, he debates between mathematics and music. He actually studies with Tomaszewski, uh, Tomaszewski, I'm sorry, uh, Szymanowski. Uh, that, that came out because there was a, a long-time active member of the Polish community, Karol Tomaszewski. Uh, you may have known him, and uh, served in the, in the Second World War. Anyway, we're getting confused here. So, uh, uh, Lutosławski, uh, yes, he's, he's brought up in the 20s and 30s. When war breaks out in 1939, He's, he works uh, as a radio, uh, in the radio communications field, gets captured by the Germans, actually escapes and walks 400 kilometers back to Europe. He uh, plays in cabarets and so forth. Polish music is banned, and yet he tries to pull some of that off as well. Now, not to elaborate much on, on World War II in Poland, but another devastating time. You have Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia teaming up in the Non-Aggression Pact, 1939. Uh, World War II begins with the Nazi invasion of Poland in September. The Soviets invade also, delivering the classic stab in the back. Poland has to fight both simultaneously. After the war is over, uh, after Poland lost six million of its citizens, you know, Lutosławski was around at this time. Now Stalinist Russia has rule over Poland. And there was this, uh, oh, what is it, what would it be called? Well, he was accused of formalist music, I believe, and you know, had to work within the restraints of, of uh, the, the musical culture at the time. But he did produce in 1954 his, uh, his uh, or Concerto for Orchestra. And uh, it's a three-movement work. Go ahead, well, Doreen. One, I just want to say one of the greatest masterpieces 
of the, our entire literature, I was going to say 20th century, but it goes beyond that, the concerto for orchestra, the idea, of course, being a vehicle for every player in the orchestra, a virtuoso, everyone in this orchestra is a virtuoso in this piece. And I'm going to go right, leave that right there, Michael, because we have one other guest that I, I want you to meet. You know him already. This is our wonderful principal horn, Jacek, Jacek Music. We have two members of our orchestra who are from Poland. And I asked Jacek if he'd come out and speak to you a little bit about what is it like as a, a Polish musician working now in the U.S. So let's welcome Jacek. Yes, right there. You recognize Jacek. You've heard him play beautiful solo after solo. Jacek joined our orchestra in May of 2004, coming to us from the Dallas Symphony, which was an enormous coup for us to get a superstar like Jacek. I mean, not only in our country, but in Poland. Uh, you have played with all over Poland, and he still is constantly going back and forth. He is one of the leading soloists in Poland, if not in Europe. So uh, we are very, very lucky to have someone of this unbelievable talent in our principal horn chair. And I, we really... Thank you. Sometimes I think you, you, you don't, you're not talking about me. <laughs> I am. <laughs> uh, we have to say that we have two Polish guys here. Well, tell them about Daniel. We are probably the only orchestra in the States who have two Polish musicians. And both of them are horn players. So, Well, thanks to Jacek, we just recruited Daniel Kedulewicz, who is our new pl player in the horn section you see, fairly new, um, because uh, he came to, he was studying with you in Poland, and, and Jacek knew about him. But, you know, you played, of course, a lot growing up in Poland and playing with Polish orchestras, and now you're here. What's, what caused you first to come to the United States to, to work? Because you work all over the world. Yes, but since... I have been here three years, between 1989 and 1992. I studied in New York and Houston, and since I got the taste of what's, what it, it means to play in a good orchestra, because I played with Houston, um, Houston Symphony and Houston Grand Opera as an extra musician, that was actually my dream to come back here and perform here, and of course from and uh, economical reasons, and that was another thing, just probably enough. Very, very <laughs> lucky for us. I, I got a phone call from our mutual friend, Bill, who, uh, Principal Horn in Houston, Bill Vermeulen, who told me there's an unbelievable player who maybe, maybe would consider coming to Buffalo, maybe as Principal Horn, thanks to Bill, and Jacek did. And this is where Michael comes into the story, too. When Jacek first came here, I was worried that he would not be happy in Buffalo, that he would not feel at home here. So I called my friend Michael. I said, we have a new person, and you have to help me. And you two then became friends. It's been my pleasure. In fact, usually, pardon me, when I see Jacek these days, we don't, we don't talk a lot as we used to. We used to have great conversations about music and so forth, but it usually begins, which hand, Jacek, dark or light? We play chess a lot yeah, I together. I know, you're, you're chess so players. He's a very good chess player. usually <laughs> takes me three out of five times, but, uh, you know, anyway. Yeah, that's funny, because when I was driving to BPO, my friend called me and said, I tell you a joke about chess. I said, what is it? Uh, one, there are two guys, one is calling another one and say, uh, let's play chess. He said, no, my wife died. Okay, so I let you play black. Jacek <laughs> <clears throat> okay. yeah, like has, has his own sense of humor too, so as you see. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your musical training in Poland. When did you start studying the horn? I would say I am a fruit of musical misunderstandings because when I was a kid, I wanted to play guitar, like you, yes. And I was bugging my mom, mom, I want to play guitar. So she said, okay, let's go to music school, we'll see. We'll see. And they, they did some musical checkup on me and said, okay, you'll be a pianist. So that was actually 
I failed the first time because I said, I don't want to be a pianist, I want to be a guitar player. So I didn't like it since the very first minute <laughs> until I got involved in jazz. I started loving it and I played, I started playing professionally jazz, but my teacher didn't like it at all. And she said, I catch you again, I will change your instrument for something else. And she did. <laughs> and she introduced me two guys. I said, one of them is trombone player, one of them is a horn player. What would you like to play? I said, uh, <laughs> trombone, if I have an option. She said, okay, you'll be playing horn because <laughs> you'll be punished. And that's how I became a horn player. And <laughs> It's a wonderful story. But then you stayed with Horn. Yes, then I, after maybe three years of consistent thinking about quitting Horn, yeah. I fell in love. Isn't that, this is also a story sometimes with musicians. It takes them a, a while, and then something happens, a concert or a piece of music or a teacher, and all of a sudden they know that that's for them. So The, the reason was that my teacher told me, you're going to take, a, take part in a competition. I said, no, 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 no. You are going. I said, I'm not going. You are. And then I realized that I just bring shame to my name, to my parents, my country. <laughs> and I started <laughs> practicing. And then I <laughs> well, looked for. How old for were you then, Jacek? I was 18. 18. I was very so late. You were serious then? Yeah. I started very late. That's my story. Yeah. He's sticking yeah. to it. Well, I, I wish we had more time, but as you know, your colleagues are anxious back there, but, but um, I wanted you to get to know one of our real superstars in, in the BPO, because you hear so much wonderful playing from that chair. And I'm so grateful to Michael. Michael. I was wondering, in the, uh, in the finale of the F minor concerto, who will be doing that? Uh, that yes, will it be Jacek or uh, one no, of the other Daniel. Players? Daniel, wonderful. Looking forward to the ba 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 pum pum pum. Right yeah, it, uh, very shortly I tell you that uh, when I toured with Christian Zimmerman, we played 40, 40 times, 42 concerts uh, in different countries. Just in the first um, part, there was E minor, and the second part was F minor concert. And there are 40 times, ba -ta -ta -tum, pum pum, mm -hmm. which is very scary for horn players. So since I'm principal right now and I had this, this um, privilege to give it to my friend Daniel, he will be performing that. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emma.